Hippolytus or Phaedra. The scene is laid throughout in the court in front of the royal palace at Athens. And the action is confined to the space of one day. Theseus had wed Antiope, the Amazon. And of their union had been born Hippolytus. This youth grew up to love the chase. Austere and beautiful. Shunning the haunts of men. And scorning the love of women. Theseus had meanwhile slain Antiope. And married Phaedra. Cretan Minos child. And now. For four years past. The king has not been seen upon the earth. For. Following the mad adventure of his bosom friend. Pyrithoas. He has descended into Tartara. And thence. Men think. He never will return. Deserted by her lord. The hapless Phaedra has conceived a hopeless passion for Hippolytus. For Venus. Mindful of that ancient shame which Phaedra's ancestor, Apollo, had exposed, has sent this madness on her, even as Pasiphae, her mother, had been cursed with a most mad and fatal malady. Act 1. Up, comrades, and the shadowy groves with nets in circle, swiftly range the heights of our Scropian hills, scour well those covers on the slopes of Parnas, or in Thryas Vale whose chattering streamlet roars along in rapid course. Go climb the hills whose peaks are ever white with snows of Scythia. Let others go where woods with lofty alders stand in dense array. Where pastures lie whose springing grass is waked to life by Zephyr's breath. Dew laden. Go. Where calm Alyssus flows along the level fields. A sluggish stream. Whose winding course the barren sands with niggard water laps. Go ye along the leftward leading way. Where Marathon her forest glades reveals where nightly with their young the suckling mothers feed. Do you? Where? Softened by the warming winds, from southern lands. Akani melts his snows. Repair. Let others seek Emetus rocky slopes. Far fame for honey. Others still the glades of small aphidne. All too long that region has unharried lane where Sunium with its jutting shore thrusts out the curving sea. If any feels the forest's lure. Him fly calls. Where dwells the boar now scarred and known by many a wound. The farmers fear. Now free the dogs from straining leash. That hunt in silence. But the hounds of keen Molossian breed hold fast in check. Let the savage Cretans strain with chaffing necks upon their chains. The Spartans hold in strongest curb. With caution bind. For bold their breed. And eager for the prey. The time will come when their baying loud through the hollow rocks shall echo. Now let them snuff the air with nostrils keen. And with lowered muzzles seek the tracks of beasts. While yet the dawn is dim. And while the dewy earth still holds the marks of treading feet. Let some on burdened necks the wide nets bear. And others haste to bring the snares of smooth wrought cords. Let feathers. Dyed with crimson. Hedge the timid deer with terror's vein. Do thou use darts of Crete. And thou the heavy spear by both hands wielded. Thou shalt sit in hiding and with clamours loud drive out the frightened beasts. And thou. When all is done. With curving blade shalt break the victims. And thou. Be with thy worshipper. O goddess of the chase. Whose rule extends over all the secret haunts of earth. Whose darts unerring pierce the flying prey. Whose thirst is quenched by cool aracious distant stream or for whose sport the Ister spreads his frozen waves. Thy hand pursues Gaetulian lions, Cretan deer. And now the swiftly fleeing does with lighter stroke are pierced. To thee the spotted tigers yield. To thee the bisons, shaggy-backed. And the wild, broad-horned oxen of the woods. Whatever feeds upon the plains in desert pasture lands. Whatever the needy Garamantian knows. Whatever the Arab rich in woods, or wild Sarmatian, wandering free across the lonely wilderness, whatever the rugged Pyrenees or deep Hyrcanian blades conceal, all fear thy bow, thou huntress queen. If any worshipper of thine takes to the hunt thy favoring will, his nets hold fast the struggling prey, no birds break from his snares, for him groaning wagons homeward come with booty rich. The hounds come back with muzzles deeply dyed in blood. 
and all the rustic throng returns in shouting triumph home. But lo! The goddess hears. The hounds are baying loud and clear to announce the start. I'm summoned to the woods. Here. Here I'll hasten where the road most quickly leads away. O mighty Crete! Thou mistress of the deep! Whose ships uncounted sail through every sea wherever Nerus shows their beaks the way, even to Assyria's shores. Why dost thou here compel me thus in woe and tears to live? A hostage given to the hated foe, and to a foeman wed. Behold my lord! Deserting me, his bride is far away, and keeps his wonted faith. Through shadows deep of that dark pool which may not be recrossed, this doughty follower of a madcap, prince has gone, that from the very throne of Dis he might seduce and bear away his queen. With such mad folly linked he went away, restrained by neither fear nor shame. And so, in deepest Acheron, illicit love this father of Hippolytus desires, but other, greater griefs than this oppress my sorrowing soul. No quiet rest by night, no slumber deep comes to dissolve my cares but woe is fed and grows within my heart, and there burns hot as Etna's raging fires. My loom stands empty and my listless hands drop idly from their tasks. No more I care to make my votive offerings to the gods, nor, with the Athenian women mingled, dance around their sacred shrines, and conscious brands toss high in secret rites. I have no heart with chaste and pious prayers to worship her, that mighty goddess who was set to guard this attic land. My only joy is found in swift pursuit of fleeing beasts of prey, my soft hands brandishing the heavy spear. But what will come of this? Why do I love the forest glades so madly? Ah! I feel the fatal malady my mother felt. For both have learned within the forest depths to sin in love. O oh mother! Now my heart doth ache for thee. For, swept away by sin unspeakable, thou boldly didst conceive a shameful passion for the savage lord of the wild herd. Untamable was he, that stern and lustful leader of the flock, and yet he loved. But in my passions need what God can help me. Where the deedless who can my love relieve, should he return who shut our monster in the labyrinth, he could not by his well-known attic skill avail to save me from this dire mischance. For Venus, filled with deadly hate of us, the stock of Phoebus, seeks through me to avenge the chains which fettered her in shame to Mars, and all our house with direful love she fills. No princess of our race has ever loved in modest wise, but always monstrously, O wife of Theseus, glorious child of Jove, drive from thy modest breast these shameful thoughts, put out these flames, and give thyself no hope of such dire love as this. Whoever at first has set himself to fight and conquer love, a safe and easy victory finds. But he, who dallies with its evil sweets, too late refuses to endure the galling yoke which he himself has placed upon his neck. I know full well how scornful of the truth, how harsh the swollen pride of princesses, how it refuses to be bent aright. Whatever outcome chance allots, I'll bear for dawning freedom makes the aged brave. To will to live uprightly nor to fall from virtue's ways is best, but next to this is sense of shame, the knowing when to stop a sinful course. What, pray, will be the end for thee, poor mistress? Why dost heap thy house with further infamy? Wouldst thou outsign thy mother? For thy impious love is worse than her unnatural and monstrous love. The first you would impute to character, the last to fate. If, since thy husband sees no more the realms of earth, thou dost believe that this thy sin is safe and free from fear, thou art in error. Grant that he is held imprisoned fast in Lethe's lowest depths, and must forever feel the bonds of sticks. Would he, thy sire, who by his spreading sway encroaches on the sea, who gives their laws unto a hundred peoples, ever permit so great a crime as this to lie unknown. Keen is a parent's watchful care, and yet, suppose that by our craft and guile we hide this crime from him. What of thy mother's sire, who floods the earth with his illuming rays? And what of him who makes the earth to quake? 
the bolts of Etna flashing in his hand, the father of the gods. And dost thou think that it can be that thou couldst hide thy sin from these thy grandsires, all beholding ones? But even should the favour of the gods, complacent, hide thy shame from all the world, though to thy lust alone should fall that grace denied to other crimes, still must thou fear, what of that ever-present punishment, the terror of the soul that knows its guilt, is stained with crime and fearful of itself, some women have with safety sinned, but none with peace of soul, then quench these flames, I pray, of impious love, and shun this monstrous crime which no barbaric land has ever done, no Gatan wandering on his lonely plains, no savage Taurian, no Scythian, expel from thy chaste soul this hideous thing, and, mindful of thy mother's sin, avoid such monstrous unions. Wouldst in marriage give thyself to son and father, wouldst thou take in thine incestuous womb a progeny so basely mixed, then go the length of sin, overthrow all nature with thy shameful fires, why should the monsters cease, why empty stands thy brother's labyrinth, shall all the world be shocked with prodigies, shall nature's laws be scorned, whenever a Cretan woman loves, I know that what thou sayst is true, dear nurse, but raging passion forces me to take the path of sin, full consciously my soul goes headlong on its downward way, oft times with backward glance, sane counsel seeking still, without avail. So, when the mariner would sail his ship against the boisterous waves, his toil is all in vain, and, vanquished quite, the ship drifts onward with the hurrying tide, for what can reason do when passion rules? When love, almighty, dominates the soul, the winged God is Lord through all the earth, and with his flames unquenchable the heart of Jove himself is burned. The God of war has felt his fire, and Vulcan too. That God who forges Jove's three forked thunderbolts, yea, he, who in the hold of Etna huge is Lord of ever blazing furnaces, by this small spark is burned. Apollo, 2. Who sends his arrows with unerring aim, was pierced by Cupid's still more certain darts. For equally in heaven and earth the god is powerful, the god. Tis vicious lust that hath his godhead framed. And? That its ends more fully may be gained. It has assigned to its unbridled love the specious name, divinity. Tis Venus' son. In sooth? Send wandering through all the earth. He flies through empty air and in his boyish hands his deadly weapon bears. Though least of gods, he holds the widest sway. Such vain conceits the love-mad soul adopts. Love's goddess feigns, and Cupid's bow. Whoever too much enjoys the smiles of fortune and in ease is lapped. Is ever seeking unaccustomed joys. Then that dire comrade of a high estate, inordinate desire, comes in. The feast of yesterday no longer pleases, now a home of sane and simple living, food of humble sort, are odious. Oh! Why does this destructive pest so rarely come to lowly homes, but chooses rather homes of luxury, and why does modest love beneath the humble roof abide, and bless with wholesome intercourse the common throng? Why do the poor restrain their appetites, whereas the rich, on empire propped, desire more than is right, who wields too much of power desires to gain what is beyond his power, what is befitting to thy high estate thou knowest well, then fitting reverence show to thy returning husband's sovereignty, the sovereignty of love is over me, the highest rule of all, my lord's return, I fear it not, for never more has he, who once within the silent depths of night has plunged, beheld again the light of day, Trust not the power of Dis, for though his realm he closely bar, and though the Stygian dog keep watch and ward upon the baleful doors, Theseus can always walk forbidden ways, perchance he'll give indulgence to my love, but he was harsh even to a modest wife, his heavy hand Antiope has known, but grant that thou canst bend thy angry lord, canst bend as well the stubborn soul of him, Hippolytus, 
who hates the very name of womankind. Inexorable his resolve to spend his life unwedded. He so shuns the sacred rites of marriage. Thou wouldst know that he of Amazonian stock was born. Though on the tops of snowy hills he hide, or swiftly course along the ragged cliffs, through forests deep, over mountains. Tis my will to follow him, and will he turn again, and yield himself unto thy sweet caress, or will he lay aside his modesty at thy vile love's behest? Will he give over his hate of womankind for thee alone? On whose account, perchance? He hates them all. Can he not be by any prayers overcome? He's wild. Yes. But the beasts are tamed by love. He'll flee. Through oceans self I'll follow him. Thy sire remember, and my mother too. Women he hates. Then I'll no rival fear. Thy husband comes. With him Pyrithoas. Thy sire. To Ariadne he was kind. O child. By these white locks of age. I pray. This care-filled heart. These breasts that suckled thee. Put off this rage. To thine own rescue come. The greater part of life is will to live. Shame has not wholly fled my noble soul. I yield. Let love, which will not be controlled, be conquered. Nor shalt thou, fair fame, be stained. This way alone is left. Sole hope of woe. Theseus I'll follow, and by death shun sin. Oh. Check. My child? This wild. Impetuous thought? Be calm. For now I think thee worthy life. Because thou hast condemned thyself to death, I am resolved to die, and only seek the mode of death. Shall I my spirit free by twisted rope? Or fall upon the sword? Or shall I leap from yonder citadel? Shall my old age permit thee thus to die self-slain? Thy deadly, raging purpose stay. No one may easily come back to life. No argument can stay the will of one who has resolved to die, and ought to die. Quick, let me arm myself in honor's cause, sole comfort of my weary age. My child? If such unruly passion sways thy heart, away with reputation, tis a thing which rarely with reality agrees. It smiles upon the ill-deserving man, and from the good withholds his meed of praise. Let us make trial of that stubborn soul. Mine be the task to approach the savage youth, and bend his will relentless to our own. Thou goddess, child of the foaming sea, thou mother of love, how fierce are the flames, and how sharp are the darts of thy petulant boy, how deadly of aim his bow, deep to the heart the poison sinks when the veins are imbued with his hidden flame, no gaping wound upon the breast does his arrow leave, but far within it burns with consuming fire. No peace or rest does he give. Worldwide are his flying weapons sown abroad. The shores that see the rising sun, and the land that lies at the goal of the west. The south where raging cancer glows, and the land of the cold Arcadian bear with its ever-wandering tribes. All know and have felt the fires of love. The hot blood of youth he rouses to madness. The smoldering embers of age he rekindles and even the innocent breasts of maids are stirred by passion unknown. He bids the immortals desert the skies and dwell on the earth in forms assumed. For love? Apollo kept the herds of Thessaly's king, and? His lyre unused. He called to his bulls on the gentle pipe. How oft has Jove himself put on the lower forms of life, who rules the sky and the clouds? Now a bird he seems. With white wings hovering, with voice more sweet than the song of the dying swan, now with lowering front, as a wanton bull, he offers his back to the sport of maids, and soon through his brother's waves he floats, with his hoofs like sturdy oars, and his breast stoutly opposing the waves, in fear for the captured maid he bears, for love, the shining goddess of the night her dim skies left, and her glittering car to her brother allotted to guide, untrained in managing the dusky steeds. Within a shorter circuit now he learns to direct his course. Meanwhile the knights no more their accustomed space retained, and the dawn came slowly back, since neath a heavier burden now the axle trembled, 
Love compelled Alcmena's son to lay aside his quiver and the threatening spoil of that great lion's skin he bore, and have his fingers set with gems, his shaggy locks in order dressed. His limbs were wrapped in cloth of gold, his feet with yellow sandals bound, and with that hand which bore but now the mighty club, he wound the thread which from his mistress spindle fell, the sight all Persia saw, and they who dwell in Lydia's fertile realm, the savage lion's skin laid by, and on those shoulders, once the prop for heaven's vast dome, a gauzy cloak of Tyrian manufacture spread, a cursed is love, its victims know, and all too strong, in every land, in the all-encircling briny deep, in the airy heavens where the bright stars course, their pitiless love holds sway, the sea-green band of the Nereids have felt his darts in their deepest waves, and the waters of ocean cannot quench their flames, the birds know the passion of love, and mighty bulls, with its fire inflamed, wage furious battle, while the herd look on in wonder, even stags, though timorous of heart, will fight if for their mates they fear, while loud resound the snortings of their wrath, when with love the striped tigers burn, the swarthy Indian cowers in fear, for love the boar wets his deadly tusks and his huge mouth is white with foam, the African lions toss their manes when love inflames their hearts, and the woods resound with their savage roars, the monsters of the raging deep, and those great beasts, the elephants, feel the sway of love, since nature's power claims everything, and nothing spares, hate perishes when love commands, and ancient feuds yield to his touch, why need I more his sway approve, when even stepdames yield to love, act two, speak, nurse, the news thou bringest, how fares the queen, do her fierce fires of love know any end? I have no hope that such a malady can be relieved. Her maddened passion's flames will endless burn. A hidden, silent fire consumes her, and her raging love, though shut within her heart, is by her face betrayed. Her eyes dart fire. Anon, her sunken gaze avoids the light of day. Her restless soul can find no pleasure long in anything. Her aimless love allows her limbs no rest. Now, as with dying, tottering steps, she goes, and scarce can hold her nodding head erect, and now lies down to sleep. But, sleepless quite, she spends the night in tears. Now does she bid me lift her up, and straight to lay her down, to loose her locks, and bind them up again. In restless mood she constantly demands fresh robes. She has no care for food or health. With failing strength she walks. With aimless feet. Her old-time strength is gone. No longer shines the ruddy glow of health upon her face. Care feeds upon her limbs. Her trembling steps betray her weakness. And the tender grace of her once blooming beauty is no more. Her eyes. Which once with Phoebus brilliance shone no longer gleam with their ancestral fires, her tears flow ever, and her cheeks are wet with constant rain, as when, on Taurus top, the snows are melted by a warming shower, but look, the palace doors are opening, and she, reclining on her couch of gold, and sick of soul, refuses one by one the customary garments of her state, remove, ye slaves, those bright and gold-wrought robes, away with Tyrian purple, and the webs of silk whose threads the far-off eastern tribes from leaves of trees collect, gird high my robes, I'll wear no necklace, nor shall snowy pearls, the gift of Indian seas, weigh down my ears, no nard from far Assyria shall scent my locks, thus loosely tossing let them fall around my neck and shoulders, let them stream upon the wind, by my swift running stirred, upon my left I'll wear a quiver girt, and in my right hand will I brandish free a hunting spear of Thessaly, for thus the mother of Hippolytus was clad, so did she lead her hosts from the frozen shores of Pontus, when to Attica she came, from distant Tanais or Meotis banks, her comely locks down flowing from a knot, her side protected by a crescent shield, like her would I betake me to the woods, Cease thy laments, 
for grief will not avail the wretched. Rather seek to appease the will of that wild virgin goddess of the woods. O queen of forests, thou who dwellest alone on mountain tops, and thou who only art within their desert haunts adored, convert, we pray, to better issue these sad fears. O mighty goddess of the woods and groves, bright star of heaven, thou glory of the night, whose torch, alternate with the sun, illumes the sky. Thou three-formed Hecate, O oh, smile, we pray, on these our hopes, the unbending soul of stern Hippolytus subdue for us, teach him to love, our passion's mutual flame may he endure, may he give ready ear to our request, his hard and stubborn heart do thou make soft to us, enthrall his mind, though stern of soul, averse to love, and fierce, may he yet yield himself to Venus' laws, bend all thy powers to this, so may thy face be ever clear, and through the rifted clouds mayst thou sail on with crescent shining bright, so, when thou drivest thy chariot through the sky, may no Thessalian mummeries prevail to draw thee from thy nightly journey down, and may no shepherd boast himself of thee, lo, thou art here in answer to our prayer, I see Hippolytus himself, alone, approaching to perform the yearly rites to Diane due. Why dost thou hesitate? Both time and place are given by fortune's lot. Use all thy arts. Why do I quake with fear? It is no easy task to do the deed enjoined on me. Yet she, who serves a queen, must banish from her heart all thought of right. For sense of shame ill serves a royal will. Why dost thou hither turn thine aged feet? O faithful nurse, why is thy face so sad, thy brow so troubled? Truly is my sire in safety, Phaedra safe, and their two sons. Thou needest not fear for them. The kingdom stands in prosperous estate, and all thy house rejoices in the blessings of the gods. But, O, oh, do thou with greater kindness look upon thy fortune, for my heart is vexed and anxious for thy sake. For thou thyself with grievous sufferings dost bruise thy soul. If fate compels it, one may be forgiven for wretchedness. But if, of his own will, a man prefers to live in misery, brings tortures on himself, then he deserves to lose those gifts he knows not how to use. Be mindful of thy youth, relax thy mind. Lift high the blazing torch on festal nights. Let Bacchus free thee from thy weighty cares. Enjoy this time which speeds so swiftly by. Now is the time when love comes easily, and smiles on youth. Come, let thy soul rejoice. Why dost thou lie upon a lonely couch? Dissolve in pleasures that grim mood of thine, and snatch the passing joys. Let loose the reins. Forbid that these, the best days of thy life, should vanish unenjoyed. Its proper hue has God allotted to each time of life and leads from step to step the age of man. So joy becomes the young, a face severe the aged. Why dost thou restrain thyself, and strangle at their birth the joys of life? That crop rewards the farmer's labor most which in the young and tender sprouting time runs riot in the fields. With lofty top that tree will overspread the neighboring grove, which no begrudging hand cuts back or prunes. So do our inborn powers a richer fruit of praise and glory bear. If liberty, unchecked and boundless, feed the noble soul, thou, harsh, uncouth, and ignorant of life, dost spend thy youth to joy and love unknown. Thinkest thou that this is man's allotted task, to suffer hardships, curb the rushing steeds, and fight like savage beasts in bloody war, when he beheld the boundless greed of death? the mighty father of the world ordained a means by which the race might be renewed. Suppose the power of Venus over men should cease, who doth supply and still renew the stream of life, then would this lovely world become a foul, unsightly thing indeed, the sea would bear no fish within its waves, the woods no beasts of prey, the air no birds, but through its empty space the winds alone would rove. How various the forms of death that seize and feed upon our mortal race! The wrecking sea, 
the sword, and treachery, but say that these are lacking, still we fall of our own gravity to gloomy sticks. Suppose our youth should choose a mateless life, and live in childless state, then all this world of teeming life which thou dost see, would live this generation only, and would fall in ruins on itself, then spend thy life as nature doth direct, frequent the town, and live in friendly union with thy kind. There is no life so free, so innocent, which better cherishes the ancient rites, than that which spurns the crowded ways of men and seeks the silent places of the woods. His soul no maddening greed of gain inflames who on the lofty levels of the hills his blameless pleasures finds. No fickle breath of passing favor frets him here, no sting of base ingratitude, no poisonous hate, he fears no kingdom's laws, nor, in the quest of power, does he pursue the phantom shapes of fame and wealth, from hope and fear alike is he removed, no black and biting spite with base, malicious tooth preys on him here, he never hears of those base, shameful things that spawn amid the city's teeming throngs, it is not his with guilty heart to quake at every sound, he need not hide his thoughts with guileful words, in pride of sinful wealth he seeks to own no lordly palace propped upon a thousand pillars, with its beams in flaunting arrogance encased with gold, no streams of blood his pious altars drench, no hecatombs of snowy bullocks stand foredoomed to death, their foreheads sprinkled over with sacred meal, but in the spacious fields, beneath the sky, in fearless innocence, he wanders lord of all, his only guile, to set the cunning snare for beasts of prey, and, when overspent with labors of the chase, he soothes his body in the shining stream of cool Alyssus. now swift Alpheus banks he skirts, and now the lofty forests deep, dense places treads, where Lena, clear and cool, pours forth her glimmering streams, here twittering birds make all the woods resound, and through the branches of the ancient beech the leaves are all a flutter in the breeze, how sweet upon some vagrant river's bank, or on the verdant turf, to lie at length, and quaff one's fill of deep, delicious sleep, whether in hurrying floods some copious stream pours down its waves, or through the vernal flowers some murmuring brook sings sweetly as it flows, the windfall apples of the wood appease his hunger, while the ripening berries plucked from wayside thickets grant an easy meal, he gladly shuns the luxuries of kings, let mighty lords from anxious cups of gold their nectar quaff, for him how sweet to catch with naked hand the water of the spring, more certain slumber soothes him, though his couch be hard, if free from care he lay him down, with guilty soul he seeks no shameful deeds in nooks remote upon some hidden couch, nor timorous hides in labyrinthine cell, he courts the open air and light of day, and lives before the conscious eye of heaven, such was the life, I think, the ancients lived, those primal men who mingled with the gods, they were not blinded by the love of gold, no sacred stone divided off the fields and lotted each his own in judgment there, nor yet did vessels rashly plough the seas, but each his native waters knew alone, then cities were not girt with massive walls, with frequent towers set, no soldier there to savage arms his hands applied, nor burst the close barred gates with huge and heavy stones from ponderous engines hurled, as yet the earth endured no master's rule, nor felt the sway of laboring oxen yoked in common toil, but all the fields, self-fruitful, fed mankind, who took and asked no more, the woods gave wealth, and shady grottoes natural homes supplied, unholy greed first broke these peaceful bonds, and headlong wrath, and lust which sets aflame the hearts of men, then came the cruel thirst for empire, and the weak became the prey of strong, and might was counted right, at first men fought with naked fists, but soon they turned rough clubs and stones to use of arms, not yet were cornel spears with slender points of iron, and long, sharp pointed swords, and crested helms, such weapons wrath invented, warlike Mars produced new arts of strife, and forms of death in countless numbers made, 
then streams of gore stained every land, and reddened every sea. Then crime, overleaping every bound, ran wild, invaded every home, no hideous deed was left undone, but brothers by the hand of brothers fell, parents by children's hands, husbands by wives, and impious mothers killed their helpless babes, stepmothers need no words, the very beasts are kind compared with them, of all these evils woman was the cause, the leader she, she with her wicked arts besets the minds of men, and all for her and her vile, lustful ways, unnumbered towns lie low in smoking heaps, whole nations rush to arms, and kingdoms, utterly overthrown, drag down their ruined peoples in their fall, though I should name no other, Edu's wife would prove all womankind a cursed race, why blame all women for the crimes of few, I hate them all, I dread and shun and curse them all, whether from reason, instinct, blind and causeless madness, this I know, I hate, and sooner shall you fire and water wed, sooner shall dangerous quicksands friendly turn and give safe anchorage, and sooner far shall Tethys from her utmost western bounds bring forth the shining day, and savage wolves smile kindly on the timid, does, than I, overcome, feel aught but hate to womankind, but oft doth love put reins on stubborn souls, and all their hatred to affection turns. Behold thy mother's realm of warlike dames, yet even they the sway of passion know, of this thy birth itself is proof enough, my comfort for my mother's loss is this, that now I'm free to hate all womankind, as some hard crag, on every side unmoved, resists the waves, and dashes backward far the opposing floods, so he doth spurn my words, but hither Phaedra comes with hasty step, impatient of delay, what fate is hers, or to what action doth her madness tend, but see, in sudden fainting fit she falls, and death-like pallor overspreads her face, lift up thy face, speak out, my daughter, see, thine own Hippolytus embraces thee, who gives me back to griefs, and floods again my soul with heavy care, how well for me had I sunk down to death, but why, poor soul, dost thou lament the gift of life restored, come dare, attempt, fulfill thine own command, speak out, and fearlessly, who asks in fear suggests a prompt refusal, even now the greater part of my offence is done, too late my present modesty, my love, I know, is base, but if I persevere, Perchance the marriage torch will hide my sin. Success makes certain sins respectable. Come now. Begin. Bend lower down thine ear. I pray. If any comrade be at hand, let him depart. That we may speak alone. Behold. The place is free from witnesses. My lips refuse to speak my waiting words. A mighty force compels my utterance. A mightier holds it back ye heavenly powers, I call ye all to witness, what I wish. Thy heart desires and cannot tell its wish. Light cares, speak out, the weighty have no words, into my ears. My mother, tell thy cares. The name of mother is too proud and high. My heart dictates, some humbler name than that. Pray call me sister. Slave? Hippolytus, yes slave I'd be, I'll bear all servitude, and shouldst thou bid me tread the driven snows, to walk along high Pindus frozen peaks, I'd not refuse, no, not if thou shouldst bid me go through fire, and serried ranks of foes, I would not hesitate to bear my breast unto the naked swords, take thou the power which was consigned to me, make me thy slave, rule thou the state, and let me subject be, it is no woman's task to guard this realm of many towns. Do thou, who in the flower of youth rejoicest, rule the citizens with strong paternal sway, but me receive into thy arms, and there protect thy slave and suppliant, my widowhood relieve. May God on high this omen dark avert, my father will in safety soon return. Not so. 
The king of that fast holding realm and silent sticks has never opened back the doors of earth to those who once have left the realms above. Thinkest thou that he will loose the ravisher of his couch? Unless? Indeed, grim Pluto has at last grown mild to love. The righteous gods of heaven will bring him back. But while the gods still hold our prayers in doubt, my brothers will I make my pious care, and thee as well. Think not thou art bereft, for I will fill for thee my father's place. O oh. hope of lovers, easily beguiled. Deceitful love, has he not said enough? I'll ply him now with prayers. O oh. pity me. Hear thou the prayers which I must only think. I long to utter them, but am ashamed. What is thy trouble then? A trouble mine. Which thou wouldst scarce believe could vex the soul of any stepdame. Speak more openly. In doubtful words thy meaning thou dost wrap. My maddened heart with burning love is scorched. My inmost marrow is devoured with love. And through my veins and vitals steals the fire. As when the flames through roomy holes of ships run darting. Surely with a modest love for Theseus thou dost burn. Hippolytus. Tis thus with me, I love those former looks of Theseus, which in early manhood once he wore, when first a beard began to show upon his modest cheeks. What time he saw the Cretan monster's hidden lurking place, and by a thread his labyrinthine way retraced. Oh! What a glorious sight he was! Soft fillets held in check his flowing locks, and modesty upon his tender face glowed blushing red. His soft appearing arms but half concealed his muscles' manly strength. His face was like thy heavenly Phoebe's face, or my Apollo's. Or twas like thine own, like thee. Like thee he was when first he pleased his enemy, just so he proudly held his head erect. Still more in thee shines out that beauty unadorned. In thee I find thy father all, and yet thy mother's stern and lofty beauty has some share in thee. Her Scythian firmness tempers Grecian grace. If with thy father thou hadst sailed to Crete, my sister would have spun the thread for thee and not for him. O oh, sister! Wheresoever in heaven's starry vault thou shinest, thee? O! Oh, thee I call to aid my hapless cause. So like thine own, one house has overthrown two sisters. Thee the father, me the son? Behold, as suppliant, Fallen to thy knees, a royal princess kneels, without a spot of sin, unstained and innocent, was I. And thou alone hast wrought the change in me. See at thy feet I kneel and pray, resolve this day shall end my misery or life. Oh! Pity her who loves thee, God in heaven, great ruler of all gods. Dost thou this sin so calmly hear, so calmly see? If now thou hurlest not thy bolt with deadly hand, what shameful cause will ever send it forth? Let all the sky in shattered ruins fall, and hide the light of day in murky clouds. Let stars turn back, and trace again their course athwart their proper ways. And thou, great star of stars, thou radiant sun, let not thine eyes behold the impious shame of this thy stock, but hide thy face, and to the darkness flee why is thy hand, O king of gods and men, inactive? Why by forked lightning's brands is not the world in flames? Direct thy bolts at me, pierce me. Let that fierce darting flame consume me quite, for mine is all the blame. I ought to die. For I have favor found in my stepmother's eyes. Did I seem one to thee to do this vile and shameful thing? Did I seem easy fuel to thy fire? I only. Has my virtuous life deserved such estimate? Thou. Worse than all thy kind. Thou woman. Who hast in thy heart conceived a deed more shameful than thy mother's sin. Whose womb gave monstrous birth. Thou worse than she. She stained herself with vilest lust. And long concealed the deed. But all in vain. At last. Her two-formed child revealed his mother's crime, and by his fierce bull visage proved her guilt. Of such a womb and mother art thou born. Oh! Thrice and four times blessed is their lot whom hate and treachery give over and doom to death. O oh father! 
How I envy thee! Thy stepdame was the Colchian. But this? This woman is a greater curse than she. I clearly see the destiny of my house. We follow ever what we should avoid. But I have given over self-control. I'll follow thee through fire. Through raging sea. Over ragged cliffs. Through roaring torrents wild. Wherever thou dost go. In mad pursuit I shall be born. Again. O oh, haughty one. I fall in suppliance and embrace thy knees. Away from my chaste body with thy touch impure. What more? She falls upon my breast. I'll draw my sword and smite as she deserves. See? By her twisted locks. I backward bend her shameless head. No blood more worthily was ever spilled. O goddess of the bow. Upon thy altars. Now, Hippolytus. Thou dost fulfill the fondest wish of mine. Thou saffst me from my madness. Greater far than all my hopes. That by the hands I love. By thine own hands? I perish ere I sin. Then live. Be gone. Thou shalt gain naught from me. And this my sword. Defiled by thy base touch. No more shall hang upon my modest side. What tenace will make me clean again? Or what Meotis rushing to the sea? With its barbaric waves. Not Neptune's self. With all his ocean's waters could avail to cleanse so foul a stain. O woods! O beasts! Now is her fault discovered. Soul of mine! Why dost thou stand in dumb amaze? This crime we must throw back upon the man himself. And charge him with a guilty love. Ourselves! Sin must be hid by sin. The safest way is to go straight forward on the course you fear. Who is to know? Since no one saw the deed. Whether we dared. Ourselves. Or suffered ill. Help. Help. Ye dames of Athens. Faithful band of slaves. Bring aid. Behold Hippolytus. With vile adultery. Attacks the queen. He has her in his power. He threatens death. At point of sword he storms her chastity. There. He has gone in haste. And left behind his sword in trembling. Panic-stricken flight. This proof of guilt we'll keep. But first restore the stricken queen to life. Let all remain just as they are. Her locks disheveled. Torn. To show how great a wrong she has endured. Back to the city bear her now. Revive. My mistress. Why dost seek to harm thyself and shun thy comrade's eyes? For be thou sure not circumstance but will can make him pure. He fled away like the storm blast wild. More swift than cloud compelling winds. And swifter than the comet's torch. When? Driven before the wind. It speeds with long drawn. Trailing fires. Let fame. That boasts of her olden times. Compare with thine all ancient charms. Beyond compare does thy beauty shine. Clear and bright as the full orbed moon. When? With waxing hours in splendor joined. Night long she speeds her shining car. And her ruddy face so brightly gleams. That the fires of the lesser stars are dimmed. He is fair as the messenger of night. When he leads the evening shadows in. Himself new bathed in the ocean's foam. Or when? The darkness put to flight. He heralds the dawn. Bright Lucifer. And thou of the Thyasus. Indian Bacchus. With the flowing locks of endless youth. With thine ivy-clad spear the tigers driving. And thy turban set on thy horned head. Not thus will thy glorious locks outshine the unadorned hair of Hippolytus. And admire not thy beauty overmuch. For fame has spread the story far. How Phaedra's sister preferred to thee. O Bromius. A mortal man. Ah beauty. A doubtful boon art thou. The gift of a fleeting hour. How swift on flying feet thou glidest away. So flowery meadows of the spring the summer's burning heat devours. When midday's raging sun rides high. And night's brief round is hurried through. As the lilies languish on their stems. So pleasing tresses fail the head. And swiftly is the radiance dimmed which gleams from the tender cheeks of youth. Each day hath its spoil from the lovely form. For beauty flees and soon is gone. Who then would trust a gift so frail? Nay, use its joys. While still thou mayst, 
for silent time will soon destroy thee, and hours to baser hours steal on. Why seek the desert wilds? Thy form is no more safe in pathless ways, if in the forest's depths thou hide. When Titan brings the noonday heat, the saucy nades will surround thee, who are wont in their clear springs to snare the lovely youth, and gainst thy sleep the wanton goddesses of groves, the dryads, who the roving pans drive in pursuit, will mischief plot, or else that glowing star, whose birth the old Arcadians beheld, will see thee from the spangled sky, and straight forget to drive her car, of late she blushed a fiery red, and yet no staining cloud obscured her shining disc, but we, in fear for her troubled face, clashed cymbals loud, deeming her harried by the charms of Thessaly, but for thee alone was all her toil, thou wast the cause of her long delay, for, seeing thee, the night's fair goddess checked her course, if only winter's blasts would beat less fiercely on that face of thine, if less it felt the sun's hot rays, more bright than Parian marble's gleam would it appear, how beautiful the manly sternness in thy face, thy brow's dark frowning majesty, compare with Phoebus that fair neck, his hair over his shoulders flowing free, unbound by fillet, ornaments and shelters him, a shaggy brow becomes thee best, thee, shorter locks, in tossing disarray, tis thine the rough and warlike gods to meet in strife, and by thy mighty strength to overcome them, even now, the muscles of a Hercules thy youthful arms can match, thy breast is broader than the breast of Mars, if on a horny-footed steed thought pleased to mount, not Castor's self more easily could hold in check the Spartan Kielerus, take thong in hand, with all thy strength discharge the javelin, not so far, though they be trained to hurl the dart, will Cretans send the slender reed, or if it please thee into air, in Parthian style, to shoot thy darts, none will descend without its bird, fixed deep within the throbbing breast, from out the very clouds thy prey thou wilt regain, by few has beauty been possessed, the voice of history proclaims, without some loss or suffering, but thee, unharmed, may God pass by more merciful, and may thy form, now famous for its beauty, show at last the marks of ugly age, what crime would woman's fury leave undered, she plans against this harmless youth some fraud, behold her scheme, for by her tumbled hair, all torn, she seeks sure credence for her tale, she wets her cheeks with tears, and every art that woman's shrewdness knows, does she employ, but who is that who comes with grace of kings displayed upon his face, his lofty head held high in kingly pride, in countenance, how like the young Pyrethoas he seems, were not his cheeks too deadly pale and wan, and if his hair fell not in locks unkempt, behold, tis Theseus self returned to earth, Act 3. At last have I escaped from endless night, that shadowy realm which close confines the dead, and now my eyes can scarce endure the light which I have long desired. Eleusan now has four times reaped her ripened grain, the gift Triptolemus bestowed, thrice and again has Libra measured equal day and night, since dubious battling with an unknown fate, has held me in the toils of life and death, to me. Though dead to all things else, one part of life remained, the consciousness of ill, Alcides was the end, when he came down to bring the dog by force from Tartarus, he brought me also to the upper world, but ah! my weary frame has lost the strength it had of old, I walk with faltering steps, alas! how great a task it was to reach the world of light from lower Phlegethon, to flee from death and follow Hercules, but why this sound of wailing in my ears, let someone tell, for agonies of woe and grief and lamentations sad I meet upon the very threshold of my home, a fitting welcome to a guest from hell, the queen is obstinately bent on death, and scorns the strong remonstrance of our tears, why should she die, her husband safe returned, that very cause compels her speedy death, thy words are dark and hide some weighty truth, speak out and tell what grief weighs down her soul, she tells her grief to none, some secret woe she hides within her heart, 
and is resolved to take her secret with her to the grave. But speed thee to her. There is need of haste. Unbar the close shut portals of my house, my queen. Is it thus thou dost receive thy lord, and welcome back thy husband long desired? Nay, put away the sword from thy right hand, and give me heart again. Reveal to me the cause that forces thee to flee from life. Alas! Great Theseus, by thy kingly power, and by thy children's souls, by thy return, and by my ashes, suffer me to die. What cause compels thy death? The fruit of death would perish if I let its cause be known. None else shall hear it save myself alone. A chaste wife fears her husband most of all. Speak out. I'll hide thy secret in my heart. The secret thou wouldst have another guard. First, guard thyself. No chance of death thou'lt find. Death cannot fail the heart that's bent on death. Confess what sin must be atoned by death. My life. Will not my tears avail with thee? That death is best which one's own friends lament. She still persists in silence. By the lash and chains shall her old nurse be forced to tell what she will not declare. Put her in chains. Now let the lash lay bare her hidden thoughts. Hold. Stay thy hand. For I myself will speak. Why dost thou turn thy grieving face away? And hide the quickly rising shower of tears behind thy robe. Thee? Thee do I invoke. O Father of the Gods! And thee? O Son! Thou shining glory of the heavenly dome! On whom as founder doth our house depend! I call ye both to witness that I strove against his prayers, though sorely tried, to threats of death my spirit did not yield, but force overcame my body, this the shameful stain upon my honour which my blood must cleanse. Come! Tell! Who hath defiled our honour so? whom thou wouldst least expect. But who is he? I wait to hear his name. This sword shall tell, which in his terror at our loud laments, the adulterer left, fearing the citizens. Ah me! What villainy do I behold? What monstrous deed is this? The royal sword, its ivory hilt with tiny signs engraved, shines out. The glory of the Athenian race. But he, where has he gone? These slaves have seen how, born on speeding feet, he fled away. O oh, holy piety! O oh, thou who reignest in heaven, and thou who rulest in the seas! Whence came this base infection of our race? Was he of Grecian birth? Or did he spring from Scythian Taurus or some Colchian stream? The type reverts to its ancestral stock, and blood ignoble but repeats its source. This is the madness of that savage race, to scorn all lawful love, and prostitute at last the long-chased body to the crowd. Oh! Loathsome race, restrained by no good laws which milder climes revere, the very beasts shun love incestuous, and keep the laws of nature with instinctive chastity. Where is that face, that feigned austerity, that rough and careless garb that sought to ape the ancient customs? Where that aspect stern, that sour severity which age assumes, O life! Two-faced, how thou dost hide thy thoughts, for fairest faces cover foulest hearts, the chaste demeanour hides in chastity, the gentle boldness, seeming goodness, sin. False men approve the truth, the faint of heart affect a blustering mood, O thou! Of woods enamoured, savage! rough and virgin pure, didst thou reserve thyself for me alone, on my couch first, and with so fell a crime wast thou inclined to try thy manly powers, now, now I thank the kindly gods of heaven that long ago I slew Antiope, that, when I went below to Stygian caves, I did not leave thy mother for thy lust, go, get thee far away to unknown lands, and there, Though to her utmost bounds removed, the earth should hem thee off by ocean's wastes. Though thou shouldst dwell at the Antipodes, though to the frigid northern realms thou go, and deep within her farthest caverns hide, or though beyond the reach of winter placed, and drifting snows, 
Thou leave the boisterous threats of frosty Boreas in mad pursuit. Thou still shalt meet thy fitting punishment. Persistent shall I chase thee in thy flight through all thy hiding places. Ways remote? Hemmed in. Secluded. Hard and trackless ways. I'll traverse in pursuit. No obstacle shall block my way. Thou knowst whence I return. And with a spears cannot be hurled at the isle hurl my prayers. My father of the sea once promised me that thrice I might prevail with him in prayer. And ratified the boon by oath upon the inviolable sticks. Thou ruler of the sea, the boon bestow. And grant my prayer. Let not Hippolytus live to behold another sun's bright rays. But may he go to meet those shades of hell enraged at my escape. O oh, father! Now I pray that aid which still I deprecate. This last of thy three boons I would not use. If I were not beset by grievous ills. Amidst the depths of hell and dreadful dis. Amidst the infernal king's pursuing threats. I did not call on thee. But now I claim thy promise. Father! Why delay thine aid? Why are thy waves inactive? Let the winds that drive the blackening clouds bring darkness on. Snatch stars and sky from sight. Pour forth the sea. Arouse thy watery monsters. And let loose on him from ocean's depths thy swelling waves. Great nature. Mother of the gods. And thou. Fire-girt Olympus Lord. Who speedest through the flying skies the scattered stars. The wandering ways of constellations. And the heavens upon their whirling axes turnest. Why is thy care so great to keep the annual highways of the air? That now the hoary frosts may strip the woods of leaves. And now the trees may spread once more their pleasant shade. That now the summer's fervent heat may ripen Sia's gift. And soon her strength the autumn may subdue. But why? Though thou dost rule so wide. Though in thy hand the ponderous worlds are poised. And calmly wheel along their appointed ways. Why dost thou shun the affairs of men and have no care for them? Art not solicitous that good should prosper, and that sin receive its just deserts? But no. Blind fortune rules the affairs of men, dispensing with unthinking hand her gifts, oft favoring the worst, and so the violent oppress the innocent, and fraud holds sway in highest places. To the hands of brutish men the rabble most rejoice to trust their government the same they honor and they hate, with fickle will. Sad virtue finds her recompense for righteousness all gone away, and poverty, relentless, follows innocence, while, deep entrenched in wickedness, the adulterer sits secure, and reigns. O oh, modesty, an empty name, and worth, a glorious cheat. But what would yonder messenger announce, who comes in haste, with woeful countenance. Act 4. O slavery! Thou hard and bitter lot! Why must I voice these woes unspeakable? Fear not! But boldly tell the worst mischance. For mine a heart not unprepared for grief. My tongue can find no words to voice its woe. But speak! What evil fortune still besets my shattered house? Hippolytus is dead. The father knew long since his son had died. But now the adulterer has met his end. Tell me. I pray. The manner of his death. When? Fleeing forth. He left the city's walls. With maddened speed he hurried on his way. And quickly yoked his charges to his car. And curbed them to his will with close-drawn reins. And then? With much wild speech. And cursing loud his native land. Oft calling on his sire. He fiercely shook the reins above his steeds, when suddenly, far up the vast sea roared, and heaved itself to heaven. No wind was there to stir the sea, no quarter of the sky broke in upon its peace. The rising waves were by their own peculiar tempest raised. No blast so great had ever stirred the straits of Sicily, nor had the deep ever swelled with such wild rage before the north wind's breath, when high cliffs trembled with the shock of waves and hoary foam smote high Lucate's top. The sea then rose into a mighty heap, and, big with monstrous birth, was landward born. For no ship's wrecking was this swelling pest intended. Landward was its aim. The flood rolled shoreward heavily, 
something unknown within its laden bosom carrying. What land? Newborn. Will lift its head aloft. Is some new island of the Cyclades arising. Now the rocky heights are hid. Held sacred to the Epidorian god. And those high crags well known for Skiran's crime. No longer can be seen that land whose shores are washed by double seas. While in a maze we look in fear and wonder. Suddenly the whole sea bellows. And on every side the towering cliffs re-echo with the roar. While all their tops the leaping spray bedews. The deep spouts forth and vomits up its waves in alternating streams. Like some huge whale which roves the ocean. Spouting up the floods. Then did that mound of waters strongly heave and break itself. And threw upon the shore a thing more terrible than all our fears. The sea itself rushed landward. Following that monstrous thing. I shudder at the thought. What form and bearing had the monster huge? A bullet was in form. With dark green neck uplifted high. Its lofty front adorned with verdant mane. Its ears with shaggy hair were rough. Its horns with changing color flashed. Such as the lord of some fierce herd would have both earth and ocean born. He vomits flames. With flames his fierce eyes gleam. His glossy neck great couch like muscles shows. And as he breathes. His spreading nostrils quiver with the blast of his deep panting. Breast and dewlap hang all green with clinging moss. And on his sides red lichens cling. His hinder parts appear in monstrous shape. And like some scaly fish his vast and shapeless members drag along as are those monsters of the distant seas which swallow ships, and spout them forth again. The countryside was panic-stricken, herds in frenzied terror scattered through the fields. Nor did the herdsmen think to follow them. The wild beasts in the forest pastures fled in all directions, and the hunters shook with deadly fear. Hippolytus alone was not afraid, but curbed his frantic steeds with close-drawn reins, and with his well-known voice he cheered them on. The road to Argos runs precipitous along the broken hills, on one side bordered by the roaring sea. Here does that massive monster wet himself and kindle hot his wrath. Then, when he felt his courage strong within his breast, and when his power to attempt the strife he had rehearsed, he charged Hippolytus with headlong course, the ground scarce touching with his bounding feet, and, fearful, stopped before the trembling steeds. But this thy son, with savage countenance, stood steadfast, threatening. Before the foe, his features changed not, while he thundered loud. This empty terror cannot daunt my soul, for twas my father's task to vanquish bulls. But straightway, disobedient to the reins, the horses hurried off the car, and now, the highway leaving, maddened by their fear, they plunged along wherever their terror led, and took their way among the rocky fields. But he, their driver, as some captain strong holds, straight his bark upon the boisterous sea, lest she oppose her side against the waves, and by his art escapes the yawning floods. Not otherwise he guides the whirling car, for now with tight-drawn reins he curbs his steeds, and now upon their backs he plies the lash but doggedly that monster kept along, now running by their side, now leaping straight upon them as they came, from every hand great fear inspiring. Soon all further flight was checked, for that dread, horned, ocean beast with lowering front charged full against their course. Then, truly, did the horses, wild with fear, break loose from all control, and from the yoke they madly struggled to withdraw their necks, their master hurling to their stamping feet. Headlong among the lossened reins he fell, his form all tangled in their clinging strands. The more he struggled to release himself the tighter those relentless fetters bound. The steeds perceived what they had done. And now, with empty car, and no one mastering them, they ran where terror bad. Just so? Of old not recognizing their accustomed load, and hot with anger that the car of day had been entrusted to a spurious sun. The steeds of Phoebus hurled young Phaethon far through the airs of heaven in wandering course. Now far and wide he stains the fields with blood, his head rebounding from the smitten rocks, 
the bramble thickets pluck away his hair, and that fair face is bruised upon the stones. His fatal beauty which had been his bane, is ruined now by many a wound. His limbs are dragged along upon the flying wheels. At last, his bleeding trunk upon a charred and pointed stake is caught, pierced through the groin, and for a little, by its master held. The car stood still, the horses by that wound were held a while, but soon they break delay, and break their master too, while on they rush, the whipping branches cut his dying form, the rough and thorny brambles tear his flesh, and every bush retains its part of him, now bands of servants scour those woeful fields, those places where Hippolytus was dragged, and where his bloody trail directs the way, and sorrowing dogs trace out their master's limbs but not as yet has all this careful toil of grieving friends sufficed to gather all, and has it come to this, that glorious form, but now the partner of his father's realm, and his acknowledged heir, illustrious youth, who shone refulgent like the stars, behold his scattered fragments for the funeral pile they gather up and heap them on the bier, O mother nature, all too potent thou, how firmly dost thou hold me by the ties of blood, how thou dost force me to obey thy will, I wished to slay my guilty son, while yet he lived, but now I mourn his loss, one may not rightly mourn what he has willed, this is indeed the crowning woe, I think, when chance fulfills the prayers we should not make, if still you hate your son, why weep for him, because I slew, not lost my son, I weep, how on the wheel of circumstance we mortals whirl, Gainst humble folk does fate more gently rage, and God more lightly smites the lightly blessed. A life in dim retirement spent ensures a peaceful soul, and he who in a lowly cottage dwells may live to tranquil age at last. The mountain tops that pierce the skies, feel all the stormy winds that blow. Fierce Eurus. Notus, and the threats of Boreas, and Chorus too. Storm, bringer the veil low-lying seldom feels the thunder's stroke, but Caucasus, the huge, and the lofty Phrygian groves of Mother Sibylle have felt the bolts of Jove the thunderer, for Jupiter in jealousy attacks the heights too near his skies, but never is the humble roof uptorn by jealous heaven's assaults, round mighty kings and homes of kings he thunders, the passing hour on doubtful wings flits ever, nor may any claim swift fortune's pledge, Behold our King, who sees at last the glowing stars and light of day, the gloom of hell behind him left, a sad return laments, for this his welcome home he finds more sorrowful by far than dismal, dark Avernus self, O Pallas, by the Athenian race in reverence held, that once again thy Theseus sees the light of day, and has escaped the pools of Styx, thou owest naught to greedy dis. For still the number of the shades within the infernal tyrant's power remains the same. But why the sounds of wailing that we hear? And what would Phaedra with her naked sword? Act 5. What madness pricks thee on? All wild with grief. What means that sword? Or why these loud laments? Why weepest thou above the hated corpse? Me. Me. O savage ruler of the deep. Attack. Against me send the monstrous shapes that breed within the caverns of the sea, whatever Tethys in her heart conceals, and ocean hides within his wandering waves. O Theseus! Always ill of omen thou, O! Oh, never to thy loved ones safe returned, since son and father by their death have paid for thy homecoming, thou of thine own house art the destroyer, ever baneful thou, whether in love or hatred of thy wives. Hippolytus. Is this thy face I see? Have I brought thee to this? What sin is wild? What pitiless Procrustes mangled thee? What Cretan bull man, filling all the cave of Daedalus with his vast bellowings, has rent thee thus upon his savage horns? Ah me! Where now is fled thy beauty bright? Thy eyes? My stars? Dost thou all lifeless lie? Come back a little while and hear my words. Tis nothing base I speak, with my own hand I'll make thee full atonement, and will plunge the avenging sword within my sinful breast, and so be free from life and guilt at once, 
Thee will I follow through Tartarian pools, across the Styx, through streams of liquid fire. Let me appease the spirit of the dead. Accept the spoils I offer. Take this lock torn from my bleeding forehead. Twas not right to join our souls in life. But surely now we may by death unite our fates. Now die. If thou art undefiled, to appease thy Lord. But if defiled, die for thy lover's sake. Is't meet that I should live and seek again my husband's couch. By such foul incest stained, this wrong was lacking still. That, as if pure, thou shouldst enjoy that union. Justified? O death, thou only cure for evil love. For injured chastity the last resort. I fly to thee. Spread wide thy soothing arms. Hear me. O Athens, thou. O father, hear. Thou worse than stepdame. I have falsely sworn. The crime? Which I myself within my heart. With passion mad. Conceived. I basely charged to him. An empty vengeance hast thou wrought upon my son. For he in chastity, through fault of the unchaste, lies there, unstained and innocent. Regain thine honor now. Behold my impious breast awaits the stroke of justice, and my blood makes sacrifice unto the spirit of a guiltless man. How thou mayst recompense thy murdered son, learn now from me, and seek the Acheron, ye jaws of one Avernus, and ye caves of Tenenara, ye floods of Lethe's stream a soothing balm to hearts overcome with grief. Ye sluggish pools, take ye my impious soul and plunge me deep in your eternal woes. Now come, ye savage monsters of the deep, whatever Proteus hides within his caves, and drown me in your pools, me who rejoice in crime so hideous. O Father, thou who ever dost too readily assent unto my wrathful prayers, I merit not an easy death who on my son have brought a death so strange, and scattered through the fields his mangled limbs, who, while, as austere judge, I sought to punish evil falsely charged, have fallen myself into the pit of crime, for heaven, hell, and seas have by my sins been peopled, now no further lot remains, three kingdoms know me now, was it for this that I returned, was heaven's light restored to me that I might see two funerals, a double death, that I, bereft of wife and son, should with one torch upon the pyre consume them both, thou giver of the light which has so baleful proved, O oh, Hercules, take back thy boon, and give me up again to dis, restore me to the cursed shades whom I escaped, O oh, impious, in vain I call upon that death I left behind. Thou bloody man, well skilled in deadly arts, who hast contrived unwanted ways of death and terrible. Now deal unto thyself the fitting punishment. Let some great pine be bent to earth and hurl thee high in air. Or let me headlong leap from Skiran's cliff. More dreadful punishments have I beheld, which fleggeth on upon the guilty souls encircled by his fiery stream inflicts. What suffering awaits me? and what place, full well I know. Make room, ye guilty shades, on me, me only, let that rock be placed, the everlasting toil of Sisyphus, and let these wearied hands upbear its weight, let cooling waters lap and mock my lips, let that fell vulture fly from Titius, and let my vitals ever living be for punishment, and thou, Ixion, sire of my Pyrethoas, Take rest a while, and let the wheel that never stops its flight bear these my limbs upon its whirling rim. Now yawn, O earth, and chaos dire. Receive, I pray, receive me to your depths, for thus tis fitting that I journey to the shades. I go to meet my son, and fear thou not, thou king of dead men's souls. I come in peace to that eternal home, whence never again shall I come forth. My prayers move not the gods, but if some impious plea I made to them, how ready would they be to grant my prayer? Theseus, thou hast unending time to mourn, now pay the funeral honours due thy son, and bury these poor torn and scattered limbs, then hither bring the pitiful remains of that dear corpse, 
and heap together here that shapeless mass of flesh, those mangled limbs. Is this Hippolytus? I realize my depth of crime, for I have murdered thee, and lest but once and I alone should sin. A parent, bent to do an impious thing, my father did I summon to my aid, behold, my father's boon do I enjoy, O childlessness! A bitter loss art thou for broken age, but come, embrace his limbs, whatever of thy hapless son is left, and clasp them, wretched father, to thy breast. Arrange in order those dismembered parts, and to their proper place restore them, here his brave right hand should be, place here the left, well trained to curb his horses with the reins, the marks of his left side I recognize, and yet how large a part is lacking still unto our tears, be firm, ye trembling hands, to do the last sad offices of grief, be dry, my cheeks, and stay your flowing tears, while I count over the members of my son, and lay his body out for burial, what is this shapeless piece, on all sides torn with many a wound, I know not what it is, save that is part of thee, here lay it down, not in its own, but in an empty place, that face, that once with starry splendor gleamed, that softened by its grace even Femen's eyes, has that bright beauty come to this, O oh fate, how bitter, deadly favor of the gods, and is it thus my son comes back to me in answer to my prayers, these final rites thy father pays, receive, O oh thou my son, who often to thy funeral must be born, and now let fires consume these dear remains, throw open wide my palace, dark with death, and let all Athens ring with loud laments, do some of you prepare the royal pyre, and others seek yet farther in the fields his scattered parts, let earth on her be spread, and may it heavy rest upon her head.